Welcome back. In this set of lectures, I'm going to be talking through uh, some of the main ideas from Val Plumwood's piece, Feminism and the Mastery of Nature. We've read chapter one from that book, and I'll be highlighting some of the ideas in that chapter. A first set of important ideas that Plumwood presents are that of dependence and backgrounding. These are uh, features that characterize both the traditional relation between men and women and also the traditional relation between humans and nature. The way that this works is that men uh, historically have been very dependent on women as mothers and as caretakers and as supporters, as wives and so on. Um, but the contributions of women to civilization as a whole and to, you know, in even the things that men have done have frequently been backgrounded. That is, they're kind of uh, treated as of secondary significance or not even worth mentioning. They're things that happen sort of off stage of the main drama of human history as it's told in history books and as it's, um, as it's sort of thought about in society. And likewise, traditionally humans, while being very dependent on nature, that is um, needing nature for their sustenance, for their food, for shelter, uh, being in a kind of vulnerable position in relation to nature, needing to you know, find um, a way of, of uh, living in nature that's, non, that's not threatening. Humans, the, the basic point here is humans depend on nature for all kinds of things, oxygen, water, food, um, you know, the materials to build their shelters and so on. Uh, and even, you know, in modern societies, you think about like we depend on fossil fuel deposits. We depend on uh, we depend on a lot of, uh, you know, for r the resources that are used for a wide variety of things. The metal that's in computers has to be taken out of the ground and uh, redeployed to uh, be put into computers. So in a way, we're dependent on those things too, fossil fuels and the metal, you know, rare metals that are in the earth that are used in computers uh, and many, many, many other things. But these contributions are frequently backgrounded. We don't think about how nature is a condition of our being able to use a computer or drive a car. Um, in the foreground, the sort of main drama, as far as we tend to see it as humans or that our culture has given to us, uh, you know, the picture that our culture has given to us is one where what humans do and the things that humans do with human stuff is all in the foreground and is the main drama. And nature, even though it is something that we're dependent on, is kind of pushed into the background. And so um, so what Plumwood wants to point out here is just the, the parallel between these two um, these two instances of dependence and backgrounding, that it reveals something uh, something, um, a, a deep kind of, of, let's say, inconsistency and falsehood in the common way of thinking, both about men and women and about uh, nature and humans. This uh, traditional common backgrounding of both women and nature, things that, on which men and humans have actually been dependent on, um, is connected with the type of ecofeminism that Plumwood wants to articulate. And she starts to draw that connection in this passage here on the left side of the screen. She says the view, um, and she's, she's in dialogue with other eco-feminists that have already published on these issues. So she's trying to articulate a particular kind of feminism, a particular kind of environmental uh, environmentalist position, um, and also even a particular kind of eco-feminism uh, in, in contrast to some of what has been articulated by other authors previously. So she writes, the view that the connection of women with nature should simply be set aside as a relic of the past, which is something that some feminists have argued, um, basically suspicious of the association between women and nature, perhaps because uh, it may have played into certain uh, kinds of discrimination against women or op oppression and domination of women in the past. This view that the connection of women with nature should simply be set aside as a relic of the past assumes that the task for both women and men is now that of becoming simply unproblematically human. So she's describing a particular kind of feminism that just says, hey, the solution is to treat all humans 
the same, to treat them all as, as humans, not some humans as better than others, more, you know, more or less than others. What this takes, uh, uh, the problem with this, according to Plumwood, is, and I'm again quoting her, this takes as unproblematic what is not unproblematic, unpro the concept of the human itself, which has in turn been constructed in the framework of exclusion, denial, and denigration of the feminine sphere, the natural sphere, and the sphere associated with subsistence. So what Plumwood is um, getting to here is a uh, is a, a criticism of the traditional concept of the human, of what a human being is. And she's saying that that concept um, has been constructed in a way that men are thought to be prototypical humans, but women are not. Uh, humans that dominate nature are thought to be prototypical humans or good humans, and humans that don't dominate nature are thought to be not. And so that... Um, that problematic idea of what the human is that has so had so much influence historically is what she calls the master model. This master model is traditionally associated with maleness rather than femaleness, westernness rather than non-westernness, perhaps whiteness as well, though Plumwood doesn't uh, say very much about race itself, uh, rationality, and the domination of uh, things that are other than these categories, such as nature, animals, women, lower classes, and other races or cultures, the the idea here is that like the good human or the normal human or the prototypical human or the paradigmatic, the exemplary human, is the one that has all these features. And that means that humans that don't have these features are somehow thought as deficient or as falling away from what's normal or what's usual or what's, um, what's right, the right way for a human being to be or the best way for a human being to be. And of course, what that means is that if, if one has a feminism that, as some traditional feminisms have been, that simply try to uh, get women to be able to join the master model, um, that is problematic because for two reasons. One, the model itself has been constructed in a way that doesn't include female features. So the model itself doesn't include things like pregnancy, uh, you know, a, a, a basic biological capacity of women. And so the master model itself is not acknowledging or doesn't include a component and a high valuation for some things that are part of the female human experience or female human capacity. And then the other big problem with it is that, and, and, and similar kinds of um, points could be made about cultural differences, that the master models emphasized a particular kind or a particular idea of rationality and a particular idea of culture as the, prototy as the prototypically good rationality or culture. Um, but the other big problem with it is that it involves uh, domination, that the master model itself has packed into it the premise that a good human is one that dominates others, nature, uh, you know, those who don't fit into the master category. And so what re we really need is not just a feminism that, that says we should treat everyone as human according to the traditional conception of the human. We need a feminism that critiques the traditional conception of the human and can uh, help us to see the human or construct an image of the human and an ideal of the human that is different, that doesn't have this domination component and these other problematic exclusionary features. One more feature of the master model that's worth mentioning at this point, I had said that it's exclusionary, constructed in the framework of exclusion, as, uh, as Plumwood puts it. Um, but this is connected with something that Plumwood uh, later calls dualism which is basically, as she defines it, the uh, separating out of things, the distinguishing of things into two groups or two ex uh, mutually exclusive categories, and then the assertion or the assumption that one is superior to the other. And so this master model is very much constructed in that dualist way, that there's a set of things that constitute being a good, you know, a, a good human or an ideal human, 
and they're listed here on the superior side of the screen. And that's defined in opposition to and in contrast to what it is to be an inferior human. So, I mean, notice the contrast between things like um, human and non-human or human and natural or rational and mental versus emotional, as well as the more uh, maybe obvious features like male over female. It's also worth emphasizing uh, briefly, I mean, in a way it's a kind of obvious point, but uh, Plumwood certainly does not believe the master model is true. She's not asserting that it's some kind of um, deep feature of reality. She's saying that it's a construction, that it's a historical uh, product, that it's a way of thinking about, a way of classifying the world. It's a part of certain theories of the world or certain ways of, again, thinking about and experiencing the world, but it can be uh, deconstructed. It can be criticized, dismantled. Uh, it is possible to pull it apart, to um, try to dismantle it. And that's part of what she's trying to do in this essay.